Welcome to the Bear Marriage Podcast. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from to love, honor, and vacuum.com, where we like to talk about healthy, evidence based biblical advice for your marriage and sex life. It is October, which means that it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I thought it would be worth dedicating at least one podcast to the issues of abuse in the evangelical church. I have actually heard some stats that abuse can be worse in Christian households, not because more men abuse, but because in evangelical households, women believe that they can't leave and they have to submit to it. And so we have this whole teaching around this, which can actually perpetuate abuse and make it worse. I need to say from the outset of this podcast that I firmly believe that divorce in the case of abuse is warranted. Um, I do not think that you need to submit to abuse or that You need to stay separated for the rest of your life and tied to a man who abuses you. I will put some links to some posts where I do talk about that and talk about how some people have changed their mind about that. And we'll be talking about that throughout the podcast, but we're not actually going to debate that too much. And so I just want to put that out there before we get to our guest, (laughs) just so that you know where I'm coming from. But this is something that I firmly believe. I just think that, that we need to take abuse seriously. Jesus took abuse seriously and we should as well. You know, it was interesting when we did the research for the Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, one of the questions that we asked was, do you believe that the only biblical reason for divorce is adultery, as in you can't divorce for abuse? And 25% of women say that they agree with that currently, and 35% say that they are being taught that currently by their church or by Christian media. And so this is still something which is widely believed, and I do think that we need to do something about that. I'm going to also put some links in the podcast notes and the post that goes along with this podcast for how you can recognize if you're in an abusive relationship. But what we're going to deal with right now is the fact that many Christian organizations and books actually distort what research says about abuse so that they can keep women in abusive marriages. And I think that's wrong. I think that needs to stop, but it's not going to stop until we recognize what's happening. So let's bring on our guest and let's start our discussion. Well, I am so thrilled to bring to the Bear Marriage Podcast today, Gretchen Baskerville. And Gretchen has been an online friend of mine for a while now. I think we met on Twitter, but other people may know her for 20 years. She has been a divorce recovery coach working in churches, and she's also the author of The Life-Saving Divorce. And we're actually twins. At least our books are twins. Because if you look at our book covers, they're like so similar. I love it. They really are. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and I just thought, Gretchen, that for the month of October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, it would be great to chat with you because I know that one of your big passions is setting the record straight about safety in the evangelical world with regards to divorce and safe messaging. Right. right. What a lot of people may not know is that focus on the family actually does not recommend or allow or whatever word you want to use divorce for abuse. Yeah, it's really shocking. So I was a, a donor. I've, I've given thousands of dollars to focus on the family. My kids have gone on their expensive Brio missions trips, which are overseas mission trips twice. I mean, I was all in for focus on the family. I've been to their headquarters multiple times. I love their bookstore. And it was a shock to me to discover in 2017 that they did not condone divorce for physical or emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was absolutely shocking to me. And um, they, if you look on their website, uh, they've changed a little bit over the years, uh, what their view of divorce is and what are acceptable biblical grounds for divorce. And so I've documented that I've got on my website, a post called something about, you know, focus on the family is confused about divorce, but it is absolutely in their own documentation that they do not condone divorce for physical or emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. And so on this podcast, I thought, Gretchen, you could fill us in 
on some of the misleading ways that Focus on the Family actually talks about this, because I want our listeners to be educated on how sometimes we can think a resource is safe because we're reading, we're not reading between the lines and we need to learn how to read between the lines. And so I'm going to let you do that first. And then after that, we're going to have some fun because I'm going to read to you passages from books and I'm going to let you react to them. Um, Okay. One clarification. And that is, I have been a lay divorce recovery leader in Christian churches, conservative Christian churches since 1998. I've not been a divorce coach accepting money for Mm -hmm. or charging money for the work I've done for the last 20 years, week after week after week, coming in at night, sitting in cold, hard plastic chairs in (laughs) in Sunday school classrooms on Wednesday nights at churches. I I have done it just because this is what the Lord has called me to do. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about focus on the family. So I'm going to tell you a little story about this article. Probably many people, I don't know if you can see it. It's an article called, How Could Divorce Affect My Kids? Mm -hmm. And this article is one of the most popular articles. And there's a sister article very similar to it on Focus on the Family's website. And the problem is it gives very unsafe information. It has 12 half truths in it. Mm -hmm. Basically, we go to focus on the family. I went to focus on the family for years, expecting to be getting reliable advice on marriage and marriage problems. In fact, in their own tax documents, they claim to give reliable advice marriage advice, but then they have articles like this that are giving unreliable advice. And without going into too much detail, I started becoming concerned about this article back in 2018, 2019, and I posted something about it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And a woman instantly responded and said, oh, that's the article that caused me to stay with my abusive husband. And a year later, he beat me and left me for dead. And I went, what? You've got to be kidding me. I mean, I was so shocked. And I said, this article caused you to stay with your husband, your abusive husband, and he beat you the next year and left you for dead. She says, yep, absolutely. This is it. She says, I know this article. This is that 2007 article. When I got it, I folded it carefully in my Bible in 2007, and I read it multiple times a day, and it convinced me Mm. that my children would be destroyed Mm. by divorce more than they were being destroyed by the abuse they were witnessing and indeed were experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I talked to her further and she even told me that her children were being molested by her husband. And yet this article, this focus on the family article convinced her to stay for the sake of the kids because this article and this article from focus on the family and virtually every article they put out on divorce and kids has an under theme, an undertone that goes like this, that divorce is universally destructive to children. And then they'll quote all these different researchers and they will convince you that these researchers agree with them. But what happens is they either misquote the researchers or they omit the researchers key findings or they distort the researchers findings to convince you that their view is right. In reality, every single one of the major researchers they quote, all believe that divorce is likely the best option in a highly toxic marriage. And so we're being, we're being misled. 
I love how you actually went back and looked at the research because that's something we've been talking about a lot on this podcast lately is when you see a stat cited or when you see a scientific finding that just sounds off you know, go back and look at where they got that stat from. And that's what you did. Can you share? I know we don't have time to share all 12 half truths, but Judith Wallerstein, I love Judith okay. Wallerstein. I have talked a lot about Judith Wallerstein myself. For those of you who don't know, she pioneered one of the largest long-term studies on divorce. So she, she followed kids, what, for 25 years or something? Yeah. Yes, she did. Yeah. And she published her findings on divorce. And she was one of the ones that, that focus on the family talks about as saying that divorce really harms kids. Right. But right. what are they missing in that story? So <laughs> here's, here's what they're missing in, in, in the story. Um, Dr. Judith Wallerstein, just to put it into perspective, does deserve a huge amount of credit. She did do a 25 year long study, but it was only a study by the end of only 45 families. She is one of the most negative uh, researchers on the topic of kids and divorce, but even she herself said that seven in 10 kids of divorce turn out, you know, normal, average, very well, or even outstanding. So the concept, and so when Focus on the Family quotes Judith Wallerstein, they only quote her really negative things. They don't quote all of her positive things. So you'll never hear from Focus on the Family, or as so far, you haven't heard from Focus on the Family quotes like this from Judith Wallerstein in the exact same book, The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. She mm -hmm. says, I'm not against divorce. How could I be? I've seen more examples of wretched, demeaning, and abusive marriage than most of my colleagues. On another one, she says she gets really actually got very upset in this book about people just like focus on the family. She says, I'm aware of the many voices on the radio or TV or in certain religious circles that say divorce is sinful, but I don't know of any research, mine included, that says divorce is universally detrimental to children. I could go on and on, and I've got a, a, a page on my website, The Life-Saving Divorce. You just search for Wallerstein's name, 10 quotes from her saying, hey, when you're when the marriage is really toxic, do not stay for the kids. Mm -hmm. It is better for you to leave. And by the way, one of the reasons that Wallerstein does have the reputation as being the most negative of the major researchers is that seven out of 10 of the parents whose families were included in her research study for 25 years, they themselves had moderate to severe mental illnesses themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you've got a mentally ill parents, you can't say that divorce is the cause of all their children's problems. Mm -hmm. Mental illness is just not good for the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does folks on the family say that Judith Wallerstein says? Can you read me something that they say? Okay. Okay. So this is their claim. I'm reading it right out of this particular one, the one on um, how could divorce affect my kids. Psychologist Judith Wallerstein followed a group of children of divorce from the 1970s to the 1990s, interviewing them at 18 months, then 5, 10, 15, and 25 years after the divorce. She expected to find that they had bounced back, but what she found was dismaying. Even 25 years after the divorce, these children continued to experience substantial expectations of failure, fear of loss, fear of change, and fear of conflict. 25 years. That's what Focus on the Family got out of that book. Mm -hmm. Now, do they say anywhere in that article that if you are in an abusive marriage, that divorce may be better for the children? No, not one place in this article. And in fact, they describe all divorcees as quitters who took the quick way out. There is not one single mention that abuse might be a valid and important reason to leave. Do they even mention abuse in the article? You know, let me just look. I think the only place 
they mention abuse. No, in this article, they don't mention uh, abuse. Uh, let me just double check. I think there is a, in one of the focus on the family articles, it's really humorous. The only time they talk about abuse is when they're talking about remarriage and that if you remarry, your children are very, very likely uh, and that's the implication. They don't quite say it that way, that mm -hmm. if you remarry, you know, they're, you, the stepfather or the new boyfriend or whatever is very, very likely to abuse the kids. But that isn't borne out in research either. Mm -hmm. I know that you also spoke to an intern who wrote one of these articles or who now repudiates the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so this article as best I could tell, was written by a young law school graduate. Although I did send her an email in 2019, she never responded. But I also sent out emails to other Focus on the Family article writers. One said, oh, I was only 19 years old when I wrote that article. And yeah, you know, now I know more about abuse. Right. He says, I still feel strongly against divorce, but there are probably some things I would change if I were writing that today. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the author of this particular article wasn't a psychologist, wasn't a therapist. She was just an employee of Focus on the Family, it appears, or worked for them, or at least mm -hmm. uh, wrote this on, on their behalf. Mm -hmm. And either nobody bothered to really look at the research to verify it. And, and I, I just gave you one example. I mean, I've got example after example about how the every single major researcher in this article, their findings were distorted or omitted mm -hmm. about what they really feel about divorce and kids and all of them believe that there are absolutely situations where divorce is likely the best thing for your child. Was it Wallerstein who had that graph that you've used before? Oh, no, that's uh, Paul Amato. Okay. So, um, so for those Paul of you watching, yeah, for those of you watching on YouTube, Katie will put the graph on the screen right now, but explain this graph that we're looking at. Yeah, here. yeah. So Paul Amato back in the 90s. Okay, so we have known this stuff since the 90s. Mm -hmm. He broke up families whose marriages ended in divorce by basically asking them questions and determining what bucket they fe fell in. Were they a very low conflict family, a low conflict, an average, a high, or a very high what he called discord mm -hmm. uh, family. So very low discord up to very high discord family. What he did is he looked at the outcomes of the children from these five different buckets. Mm -hmm. And what he found was that children whose parents divorced from these very low discord homes. So these were homes where the child felt safe, mm -hmm. the uh, child didn't feel any tension, the child felt accepted. In these homes, divorce was really bad for kids. Yeah. So and probably, that's why we probably a family where there'd been an affair, like it wasn't actually abuse, but there'd just been an affair or yeah, or maybe hard or whatever. Yeah, maybe one of the maybe, you know, one of the the what Amato actually says in a lot of his writings are these were the divorces where one person just sort of felt bored. Right. And that does not describe the reason that Christians divorce. No. Uh, or Amato also describes that some of these, uh, these very low and low conflict divorces are where someone just feels like, you know, I just married too young. I feel a little unfulfilled. I feel like I really didn't get to see life. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not what Christians say when they divorce. Mm -hmm. They are usually up in that high and very high conflict or high and very high distress. These are the people where there is some really bad behavior going on in that marriage. There is tension. There's walking on eggshells. There might even be violence. There might be screaming or there is just 
so much sense that um, you're not okay, you're not safe, you're not accepted. And what Amato found is that in the high distress homes, that's that fourth bucket, Mm -hmm. that children were one and a half times better if the family ended in divorce or in right. if the home, uh, the marriage ended in divorce. Mm-hmm. If the home was in that fifth bucket, that very highly toxic marriage, that very high uh, distress marriage, kids were 10 times better off, had higher well-being if the marriage ended in divorce. Right. And even though focus on the family will quote Paul Amato, Dr. Paul Amato of Penn State, they will never tell you this, or they haven't ever told us this. Right. And this is one thing that, that I know you write a lot about and you're very passionate about is to help Christians understand that the way we're talking about divorce is wrong because we tend to depict divorce as a selfish decision made by one person for virtually no reason, because they don't believe in commitment or something, when the majority of Christian divorces are not that at all. So can you explain what you mean by life-saving divorce? Yeah, absolutely. So I identify as an evangelical Christian. I have attended church since the week I was born. I attend church now, well, not during COVID, but um, I tithe, I serve, I lead in women's ministries, I do whatever the pastor wants me to do, okay? So I'm very involved. And so I do believe there are frivolous divorces. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about I'm bored divorces or I feel unfulfilled divorces or I miss the party life divorce. I'm talking a life-saving divorce is not one of those. A life-saving divorce is for some really serious reason. That might be a pattern of sexual immorality. It might be physical violence. It might be chronic emotional abuse or manipulation. It might be life-destroying addictions. It could be severe neglect or indifference. So all of those would fall in to the life-saving divorce category. And these are the kinds of divorces that the researchers have found are actually good for children. Mm-hmm. And I love how your book doesn't just talk about women either, that you acknowledge that there's a lot of men who are, are having life-saving divorces because their wives are the ones who are contributing the toxicity to marriage. So this isn't necessarily a completely gendered thing. Oh, absolutely not. I was so touched by the interviews I did with men. In fact, they were so horrifying to me. There's a one man that I called David in chapter nine of my book, which is my chapter on men who are victims of divorce. His story was so horrifying to me. I had to go back into therapy. I stayed up for three nights just thinking about his story. And I actually went back and asked him for for evidence of his story because I knew that there'd be some people who wouldn't believe that a man's abuse and um, betrayal story was that bad. And he sent me dozens and dozens of legal documents and pages and pages. I went, okay, yep. Okay. I believe it. You're the real thing. So yeah, men are also, uh, can be victims of abuse and betrayal. So why do you think focus on the family doesn't acknowledge that there could be life-saving divorces? Um, I just think it's, it's what they perceive their donor base to believe. I think they've deliberately taken this excessively conservative viewpoint. Oh, and by the way, they do have one kind of funny reason that they do allow for a divorce. And that is if your divorce was before you got, um, before you converted to Christ, before you uh, became a Christian, they make it harder than the Bible makes it for you to get divorced. In their parlance, they say that you can't divorce for adultery if your spouse is like um, apologetic, <laughs> you know, well, hey, you know, every cheater in the world is apologetic. I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Um, that's not what Jesus says. And that's not what the law of Moses said. Adultery breaks the, the marriage uh, covenant. The other thing they say is that you can't divorce for abandonment unless it's lifelong. Well, 
you know, how would you know it was lifelong if, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If, you know, until you're dead, yeah. um, it's just ridiculous. So they actually add words to the Bible to mm -hmm. make it harder to divorce than the Bible does. It's kind of nutty. But I think what you, the direction you were going with is why do they choose this extremely hard viewpoint? And I think it's because they don't realize that they are killing their own donors. We're the people who are donating to them. I mean, this woman uh, I told you about who whose husband beat her and left for, her for dead, she said, Gretchen, I donated thousands of dollars. We were a wealthy family. I donated thousands of dollars to focus on the family. So I think that focus on the family just has this viewpoint that if they don't take an excessively hard stand mm -hmm. on divorce, that people won't donate to them. When in reality, I think that we go to focus on the family, or I did up until 2017, thinking that they had a sensible view and were protecting dear Christian, godly Christian mm -hmm. wives, and in some cases, Christian husbands. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they're just throwing us under the bus. They're rolling us over twice and calling us quitters who took the quick way out. When, you know, we struggled for years we were against divorce ourselves. Right. Now let's turn to this month, um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. A lot of people have been sending me articles, actually quite good articles that Focus on the Family has been putting out about how to identify abuse. Um, I know one of the first ones that was sent was about um, spiritual abuse, how to identify spiritual abuse. And it was actually quite a good article. And so people were telling me, look, Focus on the Family is changing. And I guess one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today too was to say, but what's not being said. And this is what we need. This is what we need to start asking is helping people realize, but what is not being said. And one of the books that they're heavily promoting um, is by a woman named Darby Strickland. And I think we should, we should do a little bit of a disclaimer here and that we don't know what she thinks herself. All we know is what is said in her articles and her books. Right. Um, and from what we've seen, she's really good at identifying what abuse is. But the problem then becomes, what does she tell you to do about it? Exactly. Yeah, I get the same letters you do or the same, you know, emails and messages saying, oh, focus of the family is talking about abuse. Isn't it wonderful? They're not as bad as you claim they are. Well, if, you know, focus of the family has always talked about abuse. I don't know if people realize this, but way back in the 1980s, you know, James Dobson, the founder and first president talked about abuse. So they've always talked about abuse, mm -hmm. but they've never let you divorce for abuse. Yeah. So um, they'll let you separate just for clarification. They do tell you to get to safety. They do say that there might be a time where separation is necessary, but they always say that, that should be separation aiming for reconciliation if possible. Right. And if not, then you stay in a permanent separation position. Yeah. So for example, a perfect example of that is Aaron Smalley article. Uh, she's uh, Greg Smalley's, uh, he's a vice president over there of marriage and focus on the family. She says, well, it needs to be a therapeutic separation. So she's not talking about a legal separation. So when focus on the family ever talks about separation, they're very cautious um, because they, they see it as a slippery slope. But you'll notice that whether it's uh, an article by Darby Strickland or whether it's a video by John Trent's daughter, what's her name? Carrie. They are great at describing abuse and they're doing better and better at describing even financial abuse and coercive control and different kinds of emotional abuse. And, and I'm going to give them a big thumbs up and applaud them for that. But mm -hmm. understand Notice that they never say it's okay. They never condone divorce for either physical or emotional abuse of any kind. That door is always closed. Now that, and, and they use the translation of Malachi 2.16 from the King James Version that says God hates divorce or I hate divorce. But that's not what the English Standard Version the Christian Standard Bible or the NIV 2011 update use anymore. Ever since the Dead Sea Scrolls fragment was published, 
1996, no new major Bible translations uses the God hates divorce interpretation of Malachi 2.16, except focus on the family does. So what's the so, new translation? What's the new way of saying? Okay, it? so I'll, I'll give you a good example. The ESV, the Christian Standard Version, and the NIV 2011, they all say something like this, and I'm going to quote from the ESV. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord God of Israel, does violence. Okay, mm -hmm. so the person doing the hating is the man, and the thing being hated is his wife. Right. That's the way the new major translations now interpret Malachi 2.16. What's so interesting is the NIV was published back in the 1980s, and when they did their revision in 2011, they changed it. So in the 1980s, the NIV said, you know, God hates divorce or I hate divorce. But when they updated it in 2011 to reflect the new findings, thanks to the Dead Sea Scroll fragment of Malachi 2.16, they changed it to being the man who was doing the hating. And the hated object was not divorce, but the wife. Right. So it's really important. And it's just a shame that focus on the family deliberately chooses to use an old interpretation. I think what, what you're saying is that if you actually look at Malachi 2.16, what's actually being said is that God is angry at the man who treats his wife badly by having affairs and divorcing her. He's not angry right. at the divorce per se. It's the fact that he abandons her well, and treats oh. her badly. Exactly. God is angry at an unjust divorce. This woman hasn't done anything bad. Mm -hmm. She hasn't uh, had an affair herself. It's very funny if you read uh, ancient Jewish literature, one of the grounds for divorce was if a woman deliberately took non-kosher, unclean food and fed it to her husband and then mockingly and maliciously told him afterwards that this is what she had done, that was actually grounds for divorce. So a man, what God is objecting here to is an abusive man or a man who unjustly divorces his wife and casts her adrift. Women had to remarry pretty quickly because their marriage contracts only allowed about one year's support. They only had about one year's worth of valuables, usually pots and pans and cloth and things like that to support themselves. So if a man unjustly uh, divorced her, she would have to remarry pretty quickly. Yeah, she was rent, she was powerless. So um, let's let's take a look now at books and some of the books that are out there in evangelicalism and show how they can be a problem. So again, right. Darby Strickland, you took a look at her book, which Focus on the Family has been has been promoting. Is it abuse? Um, and again, she does a really good job of identifying abuse. But when it comes to divorce. You found like, what was it, six or eight times that she mentioned divorce? I did buy her book. You're welcome, Darby. Um, you got the royalties from that. But she never describes. Uh, by the way, she. let me give you the pros and cons on, on Darby Strickland. The bottom line is divorce is never described as necessary, as the safer option or the safest legal option for you. It is never described as being okay. And it is never described as being positive in any case, physical or emotional abuse. Let me give you kind of my pros and cons on Darby, because I actually really, really do think that her ability to describe abuse and to help conservative pastors understand coercion and manipulation are really good. She is great on teaching people how to identify abuse and how to address it using scripture. And she gives a lot of examples that will really help open the reader's eye and help them spot it in their own life. Or if, if you're like a lay leader, like I was, or like I am, what to listen for in those one-on-one -on -one settings. But 
I don't put her book in my recommended reading list on my website because wherever she does mention divorce, and she does mention divorce eight times, she never suggests that it might be okay or godly or the right thing to do in cases of physical or emotional abuse. Mm -hmm. In fact, when talking about divorce for physical or emotional abuse, uh, Darby makes it sound as if divorce is bad, negative, or sinful six out of those eight times. She describes it as okay zero times. She does mention that divorce is viewed differently by different churches one time, but she offers no explanation that mm -hmm. some churches actually do think d that divorce for abuse can be supported biblically. And there is one time that divorce is mentioned in her book, but she offers no opinion whatsoever about it. So she does not say that divorce is okay or positive, not even as part of a long range safety plan. Okay. And at one and, point, doesn't she even say that the problem with separation is that it can lead to divorce? And so you need to yes. be very careful about recommending separation. Yes. I mean, I was just so horrified by that. She only brings up divorce once in the first two thirds of her book. All of her mentions are, of divorce are at the end of her book. So here's one of the things she says, are there leaders in your church who can guide your thinking and help you apply scripture to her, meaning the abused woman's particular situation? And then in parenthesis, she says, we should always apply it carefully in cases of separation, since separation could lead to a divorce. Mm -hmm. Oh, Divorce is exactly the right thing, the best thing, the most godly thing. Jesus said, the people who put, who harm children, it'd be better for them to have millstones put around their necks and thrown into the sea. Mm -hmm. Divorce is absolutely the best and most godly response in some of these situations. Again, in the life-saving situations. We're not talking about frivolous divorces, but right, then right. I don't think I've ever had a woman in 20 years mm -hmm. walk through my doors into my divorce recovery groups and say, you know, I just, I just didn't want to be married anymore. I was just yep. bored. You know, I just missed the party life. I never hear that yep. from Doesn't a Christian. Happen. Okay. So here's what we're going to do, Gretchen. We're going to do like a power read here. I'm going to read you a bunch of quotes <laughs> from different right. books, and then I'm going to ask you to comment. So this one, this one is from Power of a Praying Wife. I'm holding up the old version, but even in the new version, this, this line is still there because I have the new version on my Kindle and I have verified it. But early in the book, she says this, Stormy Martian, she says, you have authority in the name of Jesus to stop evil and permit good. You can submit to God in prayer, whatever controls your husband, alcoholism, workaholism, laziness, depression, infirmity, abusiveness, anxiety, fear, or failure, and pray for him to be released from it. Um, well, you can do all, of course you can, you can submit it all to God, but you know, your righteous prayers do not single-handedly change your spouse mm -hmm. and God doesn't force people to become good. People have free will. Yeah. Let's look at it this way. If your spouse was brought up in a decent home, they were taught right from wrong by their mom and dad. Mm -hmm. If they were brought up at church, they've heard a million sermons about right from wrong. They know they're not supposed to be beating you or, or abusing you or being drunk or doing drugs. They know they're not supposed to do that. And if, they're, if they claim to have a relationship with Christ and they know the Bible, God's been telling them this all along. And if they've got the Holy Spirit in their life, the Holy Spirit's been convicting them of sin and righteousness. Mm -hmm. So if they've been able to ignore, let's say that this is a, a, a 30-year-old man. Mm -hmm. If he's been able to ignore God for over 10,000 days of his life, yep. why put the blame on the wife? Exactly. It's not and, her job and I to think, pray and him I think, away. I think books can do, and this is what I want to show as we go through these quotes, is that books can handle abuse wrong in two ways. The first way is what we've been talking about with Focus on the Family, with Darby Strickland, with, with this quote 
from Stormy Martian. I don't know if that's how you say her name, but whatever. Um, is they can mention abuse, but then they cannot, they, they won't tell you that this is a serious thing and that this is, this is beyond the ordinary marriage problems. This is something right. where you need to get help. So they can mention abuse and then not tell you that this is serious, you need to get help. The other way they can do something wrong is they can describe what is in essence an abusive situation without naming it as such. So I want to read to you from our favorite book. <laughs> Here we go. Love and respect. <laughs> Love and respect. <laughs> So they have several different abuse um, things in here. So early on in the book, in the chapter on she fears being a doormat, uh, he's talking about a man who actually went to jail for domestic abuse, for physical abuse. While he was in jail, he was freed from this, from this, apparently God convicted him. And then Emerson Egrich's commentary is this, although the husband and wife reconciled, the court ordered him to attend domestic violence counseling which I think is a strange wording. Like, although they reconciled, the court still ordered him to go to counseling. Yeah, that's, that's you know, it, it shows completely a disregard for her safety. Domestic batterers, according uh, to the experts, only fully change and become safe only about 2% of the time. Mm -hmm. And they have to commit themselves to years of therapy. And that's going to take their time, their effort, their money. And very few of them are willing to go through that process. It doesn't, I mean, sure. Do I believe in miracles? Could a miracle happen? Yeah. But we don't call them miracles because they happen every day. We call yeah. them miracles because they rarely happen. And yet, and, and yet he's treating this as if all that you need to get over abuse is for him to repent. And then right. the focus of this story is actually on the wife and how she then learned to unconditionally respect her husband. So she got in, he got in contact with this couple when the wife was emailing the love and respect website to find out about materials to help her unconditionally respect her husband. And then Emerson Egrich says there was not one hint of how she took a dish in the face and how he had to go to jail. Instead, she was focusing on how much she could respect her husband. And he's yeah. praising her for, for no longer talking about the dish in the face. Yeah. And elsewhere in his book, you know, he talks about his own mother just taking it. You know, mm -hmm. he's basically teaching women that the godly thing to do is to shut up and don't protest, don't protect yourself, mm -hmm. don't separate, don't get away, that your godly prayers will change your husband and that change is, is, is routine, that this mm -hmm. change is normal. Well, I can honestly tell you, change isn't very common. Yes. And it's not very fast when it does change. And then um, he, ha he has another story of a couple where he had been physically abusive, but then again, he repents. She lets him back into the house. Yeah. And then the problem now is she needs to learn how not to react to his anger. Yes, we should be protesting against sin. What you call marriage endangering sin, marriage destroying sin. We should be protesting that. We shouldn't be falling on our swords. Now, I've worked with enough, enough women to know that a lot of times we stay silent either to protect ourselves because we know that pro protesting is dangerous mm -hmm. or uh, we fall on this, our swords because we still hold out some hope that he'll change. But once we realize that this is a pattern in his life, mm -hmm. we are here to help our husbands become better sinners. Mm -hmm. We aren't here to cover up their sins so they can sin better and more frequently. God did not put us on this planet. And I'm, I'm quoting Sarah K. Ramsey, who just says it so well, to make them better domestic violence offenders. <laughs> that is not what God calls us. We are to be living. Is that a holy marriage? Is a holy marriage a marriage that is frightened, scared? I'll tell you that in, in, in my marriage, my marriage was not holy. It was a marriage between two Christians. We went to church every week, mm -hmm. but it was not a safe marriage. It was not a marriage with integrity. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a marriage with honesty. It wasn't a marriage that was safe. It wasn't a marriage that was free from sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. So I was not put on this planet to help my ex-husband 
sin even more. Yeah. Okay. Let me give you, let me give you another quote. This is from both every man's battle and every heart restored. So they, they quote it in both. Okay. Um, but they say, we have heard stories about some husbands who coerced their wives into sexual intercourse one, two, and sometimes three times a day. If your husband is demanding sex more than once a day, he likely has a lust problem that needs to be dealt with. Oh, well, if he's demanding sex, even once a day, we've got a problem. Yeah. I mean, demanding sex this this woman is supposed to be your friend your partner mm -hmm. are you going to coerce her if this is demands from him this is a problem because these two people are supposed to be friends yeah. and kind to one another and, and coercion coercion is rape like coercion is coercion rape. is and, rape and they're That's actually right. acknowledging that there is rape in this marriage, but then they're saying it's actually not a problem unless it happens more than once a day. Yeah, this is rape. This is marital rape. And yeah. a lot of the people who I interviewed for my book talked about marital rape. It didn't happen to me. So I didn't realize what a huge problem it was for yeah. so many Christian wives. Yeah. And so again, you know, we've got abuse being mentioned. In this case, it's not the word abuse, it's the word coercion but it's not being talked about as if it's a bad thing. And this right. is what happens in far too many of our resources. And so imagine if you are an abused woman and you read that, what you're hearing is what you're going through is not a big deal. Right, that this it's okay not, for him to coerce you. Yeah. And this is not so many women it. talk about kind of a carrot or stick mentality where it came to marital rape. Either he would reward her by having sex with him, by behaving better at a party, a family gathering they were going to have that night, or he would punish her if she didn't have sex with him by just being grumpy and irritable. This has no place in our Christian marriages. What is this? Mm -hmm. And it needs to be called out. Okay. Here's another one. This is from Gary Thomas's and Deb Felita's new book, Married Sex. And it has a rather concerning passage in it. I think the point of this passage, they're using the verse in Colossians where it says to put off anger, rage, and malice and put off, put on kindness and humility. And they're saying you can't have a great sex life when there's these things present, which is true. Okay. I'll, I'll give you that. But the problem is they then explain what sounds like an abusive relationship. So up till now I've read you, I've read you quotes where they actually mention abuse, but they don't tell you to get help. So that's one problem. I want to turn now to some examples of when you can describe what is in essence an abusive dynamic without naming it as an abusive dynamic. So in this passage in Married Sex, Sabrina caught glimpses of Reggie's anger before they got married. Occasional road rage, embarrassing tirades directed towards sloppy customer service, but she never imagined his rage would be turned on her after they got married. Now, I want to point out first that road rage is actually a form of abuse. Yes. Like people don't often realize this, but if you're in a car and someone is driving erratically or dangerously, that is a form of abuse. Yeah. It's designed to instill fear in you. Mm -hmm. And again, that is not mentioned here. That's just sort of glossed over. They then go on to say how uh, they had had great sex, but now the problem was because he was angry, her desire had cratered. And they say, even when sex does occur in an angry relationship, the presence of anger changes the nature of the sexual experience from one of connecting to the more soulless and often independent pursuit of pleasure for its own sake. And later she says, angry sex was different. It felt different. It left her in a different place. Um, I have a real problem with this. And I'm wondering yeah. if you do too. Yeah, no, this is marital rape. What makes it so clear? Uh, and, and what I don't think that uh, the authors of this book really get, you know, they talk about even when sex does occur in an angry relationship, that's not an angry relationship, that's an abusive relationship. Yes. And then it says these anger prone individuals consider partners as sex objects. Well, this is also sex offending. Mm -hmm. This is rage 
expressed in the, in a sexual context. I'm in in close contact with a with a man I'm interviewing over the next uh, quarter, Michael Alvarez, who's one of the top experts in the United States and the UK on sex offenders. And he said, he's also an expert witness in court. And he talks about how it's rage mm -hmm. that drives sex offenders. And so when Gary Thomas and Deb Boletta says that these anger prone individuals are primarily interested in seeking sexual pleasure. No, they're not. They are not seeking sec sexual pleasure. They are expressing their rage and that is abusive. And yeah. that's what drives rapists and pedophiles and all these people. If there's rage going on in a marriage, it is a very scary thing. And you need to get away. You need to yeah. get out of it. And the title of this section is actually called Anger and Rage. So rage is included in what they're talking about. Now, you can have angry people who, who aren't abusive, for sure. But sure. if you had an angry person who wasn't abusive, you wouldn't be talking about it this way. Right. With like exactly this, them always yeah, we, having sex and we all get, angry. We all get angry at the customer service person. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we've been put on hold for a half hour and then our phone call gets dropped and we've made three more phone calls, I'm going to blow my top. Okay. I'm, I'm going to be angry and I'm probably not going to say some very nice things, Yeah, but that is not the pattern in my life. Ask mm -hmm. my husband. I am not a rage filled person, but this, what's being described here is an angry rage filled person. And I thought it was so funny that Gary and Deb suggest that this is soulless sex in which the angry person just needs a body, any body to work out their issues. No, I'm sorry. Having a body is the wrong thing. What they need is therapy to work out their issues. They do suggest therapy, but they suggest it as couples therapy, which is not appropriate when there's abuse involved. So no, right. That is a problem. Um, okay. Let me read you another example. This one again from love and respect. Okay. <laughs> um, Got this, it. Is at the, this is at the end of the book. He is acknowledging, this is what I find so interesting. He's actually acknowledging that some people have written to him saying that when they tried to implement love and respect in their marriage, it actually made things worse. Yes. And she says, now, whenever he senses anything that smacks of disrespect, even when it isn't, it reminds him of our past and he gets infuriated. I haven't seen such rage in a while. Actually, I regret letting him know about what I had learned from you about love and respect because he uses it against me each time. I can take on the criticism. I feel I deserve it, but his rage is withering and makes me want to get away and hide. Absolutely. I hear that same story. That that book, Love and Respect by Emerson Egrich's actually merit makes abusive or, or kind of mildly abusive marriages even more abusive. Mm -hmm. I ask people in my private Facebook group for uh, life-saving divorced uh, Christians and other people of faith. One, did you actually read this book in a small group or a Sunday school class or on a marriage retreat? And how did it affect you? I... <laughs> The floodgates opened. Mm -hmm. I had dozens of people share their horrific stories about how reading that book made their marriage even more abusive. And that's why they're in my group. I mean, I, it's a group yeah. for separated and, and divorced I, Christians. And you have a great video about that. I will share the link to that video. And of course, to my open letter describing my problems with love and respect. But here's the issue that I have with this. When you're describing a man with, with such withering rage that she feels like she has to get away and hide. That is abuse without saying the word. Yep. Like I can't think of a better way to describe an abusive dynamic, withering rage so much so that she feels like she needs to hide to protect herself. Yep. And yet instead of being concerned for her, Emerson Egrich then goes on to tell her that she should not see herself as a victim. She needs to give her husband unconditional respect. And he describes how his mother had been abused, but she learned not to see herself as a victim. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, that's that story is just awful. You know, what was interesting as when I read this passage was that he was complaining more about her tone than what she was saying. Basically, 
Egrich is, is giving the husband a free pass. He doesn't have to deal with any of the real problems in the marriage or, or things that are you know difficult going on in the home. Because if her tone, he doesn't like her tone, if the tone doesn't sound respectful, then she's sinning. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, Egrich is just giving a free pass over and over to abusive husbands who don't want to deal with the real problems or even just good halfway decent husbands yes. who don't want to uh, deal with uh, the issues that come up in a normal home. And this is what we see. And, I, and I'll, I'll stop reading passages. I've got more I could read, but we'll stop there. But this is what happens again and again in so many Christian resources as they are describing what is an abusive dynamic and they're not naming it as abuse. Yeah. And then they're saying that this is just like any other problem that you can solve. And the thing is, abuse can't be solved. You cannot solve abuse because you didn't cause it. Right. And right. So you cannot solve it. And what you need to be told is it is okay to get to safety. It is okay to get to safety. Um, interestingly, just as we've been talking about this, uh, Gary Thomas, put, who, who's been getting a lot of flack for his new book, Married Sex, a lot of flack just put up a, a Facebook status. And I just want to read you the end of it. He's talking about an encouraging note that he got from a pastor who read the book and who is complaining about the one-star reviews. And this is what the pastor says. This is the last paragraph of, of the note that Gary Thomas put up. This is a difficult topic to write about, meaning married sex, without triggering some passionate and at times unfair responses, which are easily platformed on social media and Amazon reviews. But the reader who gives Gary and Deborah a chance and reads their words carefully and charitably will be rewarded with a rich discussion of the common struggles and wondrous blessings of married sex. And what I find so interesting there is that Gary is asking readers to read his words carefully and charitably. Right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't assume they meant something that they didn't say. We shouldn't assume the worst. We should be charitable when we're reading their words. But the thing is, their words can actually harm. Right. And what I'm hoping is that authors stop asking their readers to give them a break. And the authors start realizing we have responsibility towards our readers. Exactly. And his words are saying that rage-filled sex is a problem that needs to be solved in the couple. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we read your words carefully. And even yeah. the most charitable reading of those words is still dangerous and destructive. Because there's a word missing and that word is abuse. Exactly. Yeah. That's actually a really good place to end. I love that. So Gretchen, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate that. Why don't you tell people where they can find you? All right. My name is Gretchen Baskerville. You can find me online at Life savingdivorce.com. You can find me on Facebook under Gretchen Baskerville. I do have a private Facebook group. You have to answer four questions in order to get in. It's called Life Saving Divorce for Separated or Divorced Christians. You can find me on Twitter at GG Baskerville or Gretchen Baskerville. And you can find me on Instagram and oh, YouTube. I do a lot of YouTube mm -hmm. videos. And we will put all those links in the post that goes along with this and in the podcast notes so you can find Gretchen. She's a great friend and she's been a great, um, great help to me as I've been processing a lot of this stuff too. So thank you so much, Gretchen, for all that you do. You're welcome. Thanks, Gretchen. It was great to have her on. And again, I will have those links that she mentioned um, in the podcast notes and the post that goes along with this podcast. And if you are in an abusive marriage, um, I do ask you to please call a domestic abuse hotlines. Please see a licensed counselor and please get help because God does not want you in that situation. All right. As we get ready to wrap up the podcast, I will just mention that Rebecca, my daughter, who is usually on the Bear Marriage podcast, is just about ready to deliver. Um, should be pretty soon, hopefully within the next week or two. Um, and so we've recorded some podcasts earlier that, that she'll be on in the next little while, even if she's got the baby, but you can pray for us. I want to end with something happy. There was a new five-star review, well, actually several new five-star reviews that came in for the Great Sex Rescue on Amazon this week. And this one made me particularly happy. This is from a woman named Kate and she entitles it, The World Will Feel the Fire and Finally Know. 
She writes, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Newsies, but this book is like the scene at the end when the boys are sitting there thinking they have completely failed. Then suddenly there is a roar of a crowd in the background and thousands of kids have come to join in their protest. That's what this book was to me. It validated that my experience has been felt by others and that we're not going to continue to live like that anymore. There are things that purity culture taught me that I had felt uncomfortable with, like how women are responsible for men's lust, but I couldn't really explain why. This book helped with that. There are also teachings that I accepted, like women need to be the gatekeepers of purity and they have to give to their husband whatever, whenever he wants it, that I hadn't even realized that I had internalized until I read this book. Thank you for putting words to my experience and to that of so many people who grew up in purity culture. When you get 20,000 voices singing, who can hear a lousy whistle blow and the world will know. Thank you. That's a great way to end this. So have a wonderful week and we will see you again next week for the Bear Marriage Podcast. Bye-bye.